people. Welcome to another episode of Sequativo. My guest today is very special uh, because those who know the channel know that one of my most viewed videos is about Dr. Grimberg, uh, Jacobo Grimberg. And he's uh, Dr. Alex Gomez Marin is a bachelor's degree in physics, a master's degree in biophysics, and a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Barcelona. Welcome, Dr. Marin. How are you? Very good. I'm happy to be with you and to see where this conversation takes us. Yeah, uh, well, you're one of the people that I've been wanting to talk to you uh, for a short uh, period of time because I just found your work. I found a post where you speak about the uh, in extraocular vision, which is one of the main concepts that Dr. Jacobo Greenberg spoke about. I got really interested in doc Dr. Greenberg uh, about two or three years ago when I saw that documentary from Ida Cuella, who is also Spanish as you, right? Yes, from Barcelona, like myself. I actually know Ida. I've met you? him. Yes. Oh, my God. I've sent him messages, but he hasn't responded yet. I would really love to talk to him too, but I think it's uh, far more important to talk about the work that the doctor has done and the legacy he left. And you have done, uh, you have been continuing his work in a sense. Uh, before uh, moving on to uh, the doctor though, can you talk a little bit about the work you do? You know, I know you follow uh, Dr. Greenberg's work, but what specific work do you do yeah. in terms of your uh, professional career? Yes. And you were mentioning before that you just met me or kn knew about what I'm doing. Uh, and that's, of course, fine and great. A another reason for that, it's because I've, I can say it this way, I want to put it this way. I've recently, a few years now, two or three years, come out of the closet. So that's maybe another reason. And so I want to start by saying that there are many scientists, many more than we imagine, that they are interested in these topics, but more than interest, interested, that they find them important in their lives. And they live kind of a split life where they, they do their relatively boring or not orthodox topic from Monday to Friday. And then at night, they lucid dream, or in the weekends, they do other weird stuff. And it takes some time and good fortune, and maybe a little bit of courage to say, well, no, I, I, I want to devote my, my scientific training to study those things, not to leave them as, as hobbies for the weekend. So I've recently made that choice. And so if since you ask where I'm coming from, I come from a very... My path is very eclectic and elliptic. So I studied, to begin with, because we will talk about this phenomena, I was a pretty normal boy. I didn't see things in the darkness. I didn't have special intuitions. I None of that. And I know many people have, and that's why they're interested. I haven't so far. Oh, I didn't a lot. I studied physics because I loved it. I, I did a PhD in physics because I was fascinated by it. Then by chance, I went into the, the field of biology, studying how small creatures process their neural input. And so I became a neuroscientist. I say I'm a, I'm a physicist by training and a neuroscientist by chance. I became a neuroscientist. I did a couple of you know, postdoctoral fellowships here and there, studying how little organisms do that. Um, and, and then... I became more interested in more organisms and I decided to come back to study humans because one promise in neuroscience is study this brain slices in the lab. Maybe a little bit like Jacobo when he did his stay in New York. Um, and then, but, but then the promise is you shall understand how human minds work. But this promise is hardly ever delivered. So I said, well, Maybe I just, just study humans. And so I studied a bit of human cognition and human motor control, orthodox stuff, maybe a bit heterodox. Right. But then two things happened to me, maybe three. 
and and this brought me more into as I use this metaphor of a traffic light. I was doing research in green, then a little bit of in orange, and then I said no. I think the really interesting stuff, promising stuff, frontier stuff is in the red light, the heretic kind of research. And this has been going on for the last two or three years in my case at, at an accelerating pace. And and that's how I met the, the work of Jacobo. Also, I had a medical problem and I ended up in hospital and I had the near-death experience. And I think that also play, played a huge role in, in, in just... Uh. You know, I think I came back with it with some golden dust sprinkled upon yeah, me. Uh, and people who do, I have one too, though, in 2014. Mm. And people who have those experiences do come back with some, I don't know. For me, it's like an urge to get more knowledge mm. and like a sense of responsibility to uh, get more people on this knowledge. And even though I consider myself really ignorant, I do feel the urge to keep learning, you know? So I see where yes. you're coming from. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, no, great. No, we're in conversation. And, and and that's another thing. The moment you start saying this, more people come to you and say, well, actually I also had one or my, my grandmother had one or a friend of mine. So it's more, I mean, it's exceptional, but it's more normal than we think. So, so I had this experience. I also got, that, I must say that I also got tenure in university, which means basically that I cannot be fired and unless I do something really odd. So I said, look, I've been given a ticket for 40 more years. I got that ND when I was about 40. Like, all right, maybe you know, a ticket for, for four more decades. Who knows? I have the intellectual freedom, not just in theory, but in practice. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. And incidentally, and maybe that's not just a... a, a it's not um, a causa, as we say in Spanish. It's not by chance. It's, there's something synchronistic about it. When I was recovering from the hospital, my, my vital energy and mental energy was really, really low. I couldn't read, and I always read, and I couldn't read. And the first book I could read was La Creación de la Experiencia by Jacobo Greenberg. Yeah. And then other, other things that probably will come up during this conversation happened to me, kind of pulling me towards Jacobo, no? So, so he's been, for the last two or three years, a very spooky, and I say it in the, good, in the good sense, a very spooky presence in my life. Like, why am I drawn to his work? Why am I meeting his former students? Why uh, sometimes I dream with him or about him? So why is this happening to me? So I embrace it. <laughs> it's so weird. It happens to me too. I have dreamt about him several times. Wow. And it's um, what you were saying about the uh, coming out of the closet so people understand there's like a really high level of stigma associated with these topics. And I was listening to a conversation between a journalist and Dr. Masters, uh, Dr. Michael P. Masters. I don't know if you know him, but he was talking about uh, also having a tenure and he uh, during his grad school years he didn't talk to his uh, fellow uh, grad school students um, about any of this any any kind of topic that is taboo he kept it to himself but he started writing a book before he got the tenure and once he got the tenure he started publishing books about it hmm. and what well the way i see it is many of these scientists um are afraid of that, not getting the tenure, not getting that security uh, of having their life uh, pretty much set up for themselves. And that's why they don't talk about it. But honestly, I'm going to be honest here. If or when these news become like more of a reality to people and this kind of new world, if you can say, the ones that are going to have the most ontological shock are the scientists who keep denying it. I don't mm -hmm. know if you agree with me. I love this expression of ontological shock. I've heard it from Jeff Kripal, who has heard it from somebody else. I don't know if you know the work of Jeff Kripal. He, he is an amazing scholar who writes about the impossible. And we're going to be talking about pretty impossible things, I suppose, later. Yes. And... Um, 
Yes, and let me add to this because it's more complicated than having tenure. Because once you have tenure, I mean, it's not like you're ready because you still need to get grants to do your research. Yeah, yeah. And if you write a grant on, let's test the synthetic synthetic theory, <laughs> they'll laugh at you. It has happened to me. I've I've submitted grants to the places where I used to get the money, and they said, "Well, what are you writing about?" And also, if you want to publish papers, you won't get them in, in journals. I mean, this sounds very kind of like a, a very particular topic just for academics. But it's important because if, 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 and it's a big if, and it's not a necessary one, if we want to do a science of this, is we could just enjoy it or we can just, you know, it's science is not the only way to address this phenomena. That's very important. Otherwise, we are being scientistic. But if we want to do a science of those, and I want, and Jacobo did, um, then we need to also find a strategy to navigate the waters of the business of how science is made. So it's not just tenure, you need money, you need students. Are you going to, I mean, I wonder about this. I, I I used to have lots of students working on other themes. Like now, like, am I going to give some of these, like extra ocular vision as a, as a PhD project for a student? Come on, when, when he or she finishes, she won't get hired in a university, yeah. right? So there are many, many socio-political constraints that that continue to inhibit. Um, and at the same time, perhaps, and I don't tend to be optimistic in this way, but perhaps things are changing. Perhaps recently things are changing with consciousness studies and with, with scientists, more scientists coming out of the closet and saying, I'm interested in these, these things have happened to me. So perhaps... Perhaps we can do it. Yeah, I think so too. Because um, I think one of the ways to do it though is doing this. Because I'm a layman, I, I I didn't study anything related to that, to this. And I think that if scientists uh, understand that speaking in layman's terms about these topics, uh, they will reach a broader audience. You know and I think that it's very important that the work of people like Dr. Grimberg is becomes more viral. Uh, I I did yeah. a tweet like a few weeks ago that uh, because in the between 1900 and 1945 47 scientists were considering were considered uh the past rock, rock stars in a sense because uh science was like uh, on the cutting edge constantly. And that's no longer the case. And I think that if scientists uh, become mainstream again, and what they work on becomes mainstream again, I think that's going to help a lot of future generations. I agree, Pavel. And and let me just bring here my triangle, which is a way I have of explaining this. Because when we, we yeah, lay, layman expert i don't like i don't like being called upon as, as being an expert and nevertheless of course that's why you you ask me can you come you're a physicist you do research and you've been doing but we so-called experts which is one part of this triangle need to integrate with with the experiences our own and experiences yeah. of lay people and also with experiments so it's like this triple you know expert experiment experiences Again, that's what Jacobo did constantly. His own experiences, his incredible experiences and, and, and experiments and he being an expert. And not only, and it's it's two ways because for instance, uh, we, we may talk about the work on extraocular vision I'm doing, but by talking about it and then being on, on, on podcast and on YouTube, I get emails that are incredible. Like, not just how sweet they are in terms of people telling me their own stories, but also I get references to, for, for instance, work done in, in, in Russia that I didn't know or in China, or somebody says, well, I, um, I have these, these abilities. Would you like to test them? And, and so we need you. <laughs> we need the lay people because, because these latent powers of, of mankind are expressed everywhere, but we need a radar to just pull them together and and study them. So it's a feedback loop. I, I may explain things that are useful to you. I know that some people like to hear that some scientists validate their experiences, and that's fine. But we must one must be careful not to not to give us the so-called experts kind of the last word word on on what you and, and myself have as as 
inner deep incredible experiences so i really i really like this idea of um uh, communion that's too direct that goes in both directions i just wish more scientists thought like you do because uh there are many scientists who see themselves in many ways above the layman you know and i don't think that's uh positive for the scientists themselves because yeah they, they need to learn how to commune with uh with the rest of people uh, they need those experiences yeah you, you're correct um about that uh, extraocular vision which it's called also uh eyeless sight you're calling it too oh yeah well it Is has right? it has as many names as schools time periods and cultures and places where it has been developed enhanced transferred yes i mean um i think that the max if you if one does a taxonomy one doesn't need to but the 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 Mexicans, let's put it this way, call it vision extraocular, right? Yeah. That's how I came to know about it from Jacobo and then from, from a lot of um, action happening in my own country in Spain. But then it was also called paroptic vision in a landmark book written a hundred years ago this year in 1924 by a Frenchman, Jules Romain. This is an amazing book. He was testing that with, with, war uh, veterans and so on in france a hundred years ago so he called it that but then it can also be called eyeless sight in the u.s i think they call it what is it vibra vision and um, it also comes from indonesia you can find it in the uk i know in germany it's being practiced too in china in the 90s there's this story about how the government even promoted and with some incredible stories about kids who could read things of course the russians were or the soviets were made famous in in the u.s in the 60s so you see depends if you go to the 80s it's up in mexico if you go to the 60s there's the russians in 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 the in in america in the united states if you go to the 20s it's the french and and so it's it's a bit everywhere and everybody calls it its own way but yes i've used different names and one doesn't have a copyright, I suppose, on the name. Basically, what it is, I would put it, it's a it's a capacity to perceive things in a in a way that seems to be happening beyond what we're told about our six senses. Right. And and of course, there are other ways of doing that, like remote viewing is another one, or maybe the perceptions we have, again, I mentioned dreaming before. So I like to describe this as, as there's this landscape and there are these mountains and then there are these islands and they may be related under the water, the islands, and we may want to call them different things. And they have differences and they have commonalities. But anyways, it's a very fascinating phenomenon to study because it defies, I mean, I'm a physicist, it defies some of the basic well, actually, let me say this and then take it back. It defies our classical understanding of the world because sometimes people say, and, and just slow me down if I'm rushing or get, getting ahead of ourselves, but they say, well, Alex, if that, what you're saying was true, it would mean we need to just, all the books of physics and neuroscience, we, we should just, the whole edifice of science will collapse and it will be chaos. Like, wait, 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 no. What would collapse is our understanding of nature that we had in the 19th century. A yeah. hundred years ago, physicists came along and said, well, what you think space is, it isn't, it bends with masses. And when you think time is, it isn't, it stretches with velocity. And when you think energy it is, it isn't because it can be converted into matter. And when you think so on and so forth. So it's um, this is cutting edge, but it's it, it can be made consistent with new understanding of of the universe of physics and maybe even of life right but it's true it it defies the orthodoxy because uh, the word that summarizes it is it is impossible for my colleagues yeah. what we're talking about it is simply impossible and i don't blame them i mean i'm trying to be more i'm learning to be more more charitable here they're yeah. not only mean people who wish to suppress what we're doing poor guys they don't have if they haven't experienced it 
and they don't have a way to even think about it, what are they going to do with that? They can only just try to put it under the carpet and say, you don't exist. I think that's part of that ontological shock I was telling yes. you. Yeah, because yes. it's the laws of physics as we understand it right now, because the science has been evolving and it will continue evolving. And there are things that we today consider magic or impossible that in a hundred years from now are going to be like the classic physics from today. So yeah, uh, it's, and yeah, it's, it, it can be considered impossible. Uh, have you been practicing or giving lectures on this uh, extraocular vision? What's your yes, work been, been about? Yeah, these are two different questions and I'm really bad at the first one. I, I've tried to practice it. That because one thing I tell to myself, I mean, I'm a theoretician by training, so I, I really like cogitating, thinking, reading, writing. But it's like, well, those things you should try to experience themselves. And, you know, I, I was meaning these triangles seriously, but I'm not so good at those things. So I've tried. I've even done some sessions with, with trainers I know. I couldn't do it, but of course, my the dedication to it hasn't has been far from, from you know, um, strong and constant. I've at least I've tried to be, put myself in the position of the people I I've seen practice it. You know, how does it feel like wearing those blindfolds? Can some light get through them? What does my mind do when I'm trying to guess something? What's the difference between trying to imagine or guessing or perceiving? I mean, I think this phenomenology is super important, like to have a sense um, of, of what's being asked of the other person, the person at the other side. But my, my work on it has been then more scientific in the sense of not so much being the subject that experiences, but the person who is trying to study the subject. And I've been doing this from two sides or maybe three. One is historical, like reading everything I can because we don't. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there are things done, I, I'd rather read them and know them. So trying to read as much as I can and, and know about the history of this phenomenon. And it feels like detective work or, you know, or archaeological work because you need to go into like really old, obscure, and you know articles or books and it's like a discovery right? every time you find something the other uh, like the other leg the other root is theoretical like what theories are there in consciousness studies and in physics that would allow us to think i was mentioning it is impossible why is it impossible it's not because of the data and we can I'll talk about the data in a minute but it's also because we don't know how to think about it. So I think there's a part that's historical. Another one is theoretical or philosophical. And the third one, probably as important or more than the other ones, is empirical. Like so I've I've you know been in contact with different coaches who train it. I've you know I've empathized with them and they trust me. And so I've been invited to their sessions. I've seen what what's happening and then we've tried things and so it kind of have a first-hand um, sense of what these people can do, and also, and this is where the this is as as they say in English, like when the rubber hits the road, like the real test is well, you may be able to do these. I mean, you may see all these YouTube videos of people doing incredible things, but that's fine. But as a scientist, that doesn't work for me. That's enough. That's not enough. You need to go and say, well, look, you can do this with this blindfold, okay? But now let's put things on an envelope. Or now, um, what happens if I place something in front? Like, do there some some gentle but deliberate modifications or manipulations to see when the phenomenon disappears and comes back? Basically, to test to test it, and this has to do with a lot of care because um, we know very little about how these abilities manifest and and. And every person is different. That's another thing. So to summarize, yes, I'm, I've tried to, to, to do it myself. I cannot, <laughs> of course. It's really hard uh, for adults especially. But I'm doing the, the empirical work I can, the theoretical work, and continue to read as I discover more information about it.
have you worked with children uh, on it or i yes i've been i've been invited to to groups of kids that have been trained and that they have their extraocular vision activated that's how they speak about it and yeah and i've seen pretty impossible things um i've also seen cheating i must say that it's very important i mean coming as a here i'm coming as alex but i'm also coming as a scientist right i've seen yeah. kids that cheat and i've okay. seen kids that do things I, I wouldn't know how to explain and i've asked um also kids to do things that are pretty cool but they still another question is how if they do it how they're doing it because of course if you're not doing it with your site you could still use other pretty spectacular but not so spectacular means like maybe echolocation or with other tricks memory tricks i mean the, the, the human mind and the conscious and the unconscious mind is very powerful so you they could be solving these games or puzzles in different ways and then in this spectrum, this is like searching for gold in the Mississippi, right? And then in this yeah. spectrum, there's a lot of stones. And then sometimes there's a little piece of gold. And so I, I've seen kids do things that um, I could not explain with my usual scientific training, right? That they can they can see things that are, again, that are upside down, that I've shuffled, or they can see things inside inside closed boxes or envelopes that they can read um pages of books and well maybe i need to do my my controls better but i don't see how they can do it actually but they are doing it or they seem to be doing it so yes i've seen it and and let me add another thing here this is very emotionally stressing for me <laughs> because uh, when I'm invited to these places, of course, with their coaches and their parents, I mean, everything needs to be done well, sure. I come back home and I feel I feel an imposter syndrome. Uh, there's, you know, like you know, like the movie The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, there's Gollum, Gollum and Schmigel yeah. talking in my head, and so one says, "You've seen a miracle. It's incredible," and the other says, "You're stupid." They're fooling yeah, you, course. you know, you're just ruining your reputation doing that. And so I have them both speaking and it's very stressful because I, I feel both things. I feel like this is a miracle and I feel like I, I'm just, I'm just seeing bullshit and believing it. <laughs> I must be honest natural, about it. That's our natural skeptical self, I think. And I don't, I don't think skepticism is bad necessarily, but it does challenge us challenges us uh, constantly, especially when we go through experiences like that, because um, I was going to ask you, uh, in the documentary about Dr. Greenberg, when they talk about these kids that he trains with, uh, someone talks about the kids experiencing entities and refusing to keep doing extraocular vision because they see entities. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that specifically? Yeah. This is a Pandora box inside a Pandora box. So we'll open it a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> and offline, maybe we can talk um, more relaxedly about it. Yes, um, I have no idea about these things because I was, as I was telling you, I, I've never experienced them, but I know people experience them. So this is really, really delicate because, mm. because some people, Professionals would say that goes towards the edge of mental pathology. Yeah. You know, because and other people would say, well, that's super normal and it's not pathological at all. It's just people contacting with other realities and one needs to deal with one needs to learn to deal with them. But you know, like like for kids, like seeing invisible friends, you yeah. can think they don't see them. Come on, you can see. They're just there and one is to cope with them. And you can see, well, if those invisible friends are saying very nasty things all the time, we need to see specialists, right? Now, yeah. now all, all of these phenomena we're talking about, they're always dancing along that spectrum. And then if you're, or in my case, if, if the, these coaches are, 
activating those latent powers that, that we have in kids and then kids start having trouble. I mean, I think the documentary maybe dramatizes a little bit the thing yeah. like, oh, wow, these kids then, then, you know, then they were doing that and we had to stop it, stop it, stop it. I, I, I've talked to people that, that have trained hundreds of kids and they've told me that the percentage that this could happen, but it's like really, really, really low. So let's think of it in terms of like, like with medicine and clinical trials. Let's imagine this, right? Like you're taking a vaccine or you're taking some some pretty inoffensive um, medicine, yeah. but it has it could have side effects, right? So one needs to one cannot say well whatever. One needs to see what how prevalent, what are those, and what to do about them. Now here there are also different opinions, and I'm not here. I'm I'm, I'm not trying to brush it off me, but I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to to just make a judgment about that but I've, I've also asked people and some people say oh if these kids do saw this or they see this no problem just tell them to put them in an envelope and send them to the light and so on like well maybe <laughs> and other people say well uh, look i have daughters uh, if this would happen to my daughters I, I would get concerned i mean we need to do something about it because yeah. if they cannot sleep at night and then they they're you know in school the, the, so it's a it's a very delicate it's a very difficult question you're you're asking me. I I would just say these things probably happen, and one needs to be have eyes wide open and have people who know how to deal with those things and also so use both both ends use the more esoteric, but that's difficult because you need to know who are the really good ones and who are not, and also use the more traditional means. I mean, why not have psychologists involved? And even even psychiatrists, if necessary. And by the way, psych I know some great psychiatrists who don't necessarily just prescribe pills for everything. No, they have a good understanding of of the of all the corners of the human mind. So, indeed, I am one of those people who think uh, uh, medicine is a little bit too overused uh, these days, especially these days, because I think uh, that. Uh, Psychologically, we can uh, avoid using those by uh, from traditions and behaviors that can take us to a better place uh, mentally. You know, and I've been struggling with this with uh, with people in my life who are prone to use uh, medicine to be better or feel better. And mm -hmm. I do think that uh, stuff like exercise or meditation do go a long way in helping you uh, mitigate many of those uh, ailments. Yeah. yeah, and community and talking about it. Yeah. Like yeah, different cultures. I mean, too. we, yeah, exactly. You just if you can, if you have friends who you trust, share it. If you have parents who you trust, share it. And this is another thing, what sustains us, like we may talk about Pachita and, and the Mexican culture around around that, in or in different other places in, in the planet with totally different cultures right um it's just today in kind of our more western world that all of that is by default defined as madness but or delusion but <laughs> forever in all those understandings of the world worldviews well the the the, the shaman of the of the town would say well this is what's happening i mean there were experts that's what i mean there were experts in the culture that would know how to deal with that and today we've you know we need to find them again because we need them yeah uh, especially shamans because um i, I was going to ask you about this I, i'm going to throw you a few curveballs i know uh i Go sent ahead. you bullet points but you you, you have you have the the, the yeah, hat ready there are some things that that came to mind <laughs> Because uh, Dr. Greenberg's work is more scientific, but I, I have to say, since I was like a teenager, I started reading Carlos Castaneda, and I want to know your thoughts on the the work they do and how they may complement each other or be antagonistic uh, towards each other. Because I, yeah. uh, in that documentary, I don't think they told the whole story between uh, Greenberg yeah. and, and Castaneda. Yeah. Uh, what's your, your take on that? Yeah, well, this brings us into the looks gossiping. And I'm, 
when I mean I can engage in it. I don't follow, I don't have a lot of interest, but I have in historical curiosity, so we can talk about it. Let me also say I don't know much about it. And let me also say, and this is going to be polemic straight away, but you know, let's just be as honest as we can. I know from a particular Spanish writer who who devoted years to study the life of Castaneda, um, that it's quite likely that Las Enseñanzas de Don Juan was totally made up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> so, I so, investigated that and I gathered that too, that it, it was made so, up. So even if it was made up, it was great. And it yeah, had yeah. positive consequences. But then the, the corollary to that is that, well, how to say it? I want to say it well. There are people who have a tremendous magnetic power, right? And, and these are delicate people to be around with because they, well, it's these dynamics of guru and then all the devotees. And I think that's what happened with Castaneda. You know, I don't want to talk bad about him because I, I don't know, but something in what I see, this kind of mega guru-like cult-like following doesn't smell right to me. So I don't know. I don't know if that's Castaneda's fault or their followers or or my own fault. That's for Castaneda. Now I think Greenberg is quite different, and I know they met. Yeah. And I actually, you know, I've I've had the 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 the, the joy of meeting recently through Zoom some of his former students and Mr. and I, de la you know, Flor and De La Flor and Lea. And I and I have them on WhatsApp, and I'm very familiar with them, and I can drop them voice messages and ask them things and so on. And and some remember some of those encounters. I think I think some of them even went went to eat some tacos with with Castaneda and Greenberg, and they can have their own first hand opinion. I think, of course, they were both both men were really powerful in different ways because I think there's a there's a, an honesty and a purity in Jacobo that I don't see shining in Castaneda. So I think these are different animals. These are different animals. But of course, it makes sense that, that, they, that they met and that they, you know, were checking each other. And who knows what they talked about and what I plans they had. Sense, I think in a sense, Castaneda built more into the dark side of things. And he liked to be more playful and more like deceiving in a sense. He'd like to test you because I see it in his writing because I read mm. all, pretty much all his books, but I do know. And I, I understand that Greenberg wanted to take the scientific approach to this all the time. And that's the only way for me to really understand, uh, this kind of, um, powers if you can call them that that the mind can manifest sometimes mm -hmm. and i understand that de la flor had uh he had a predilection for castaneda and to me castaneda was kind of on a slippery slope to becoming a kind of charles manson figure you know because he was more on that dark side and I think Greenberg, uh, what he was doing in a sense, I don't know if uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, but what he was doing in a sense was like a scientific guide to learn and hone these skills of the mind. I think that's yes. what he was doing. I, I see it in his writing and pretty much all his work. And we talked about ex extraocular vision but also the auto elusive uh, meditation and his magnum opus, which is the synergic theory. Uh, I consider it. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And Jacobo, and I never met him. Um, I've tried to read everything I can from him because this is a luxury opportunity for us to, to know about his work and what he was thinking. So of course, the scientific papers, his books, his theories, um, his experiments, but also his autobiography, and his and it's interviews very... too. Yes, yes, and then he has some, 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 
great interviews in a, in a, a Spanish TV program. I, I recall I was very young, but those program, programs haven't returned to TV. They were amazing. They, they, they had these incredible people and they would just smoke and talk <laughs> for an hour. There's you know? one on YouTube though, on Televisión Española. Sí, sí, sí. Yeah, they're, 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 it's called ah, Sol de Medianoche. And there's yeah. another one that was very similar. I mean, these are all the, pro, all the by the way, all the installments, all, all the programs they made were incredible. I mean, it's, it's with, with great people. I wish, I wish something like this could be done today. It cannot. It was so, so shallow. But this is another discussion. But re rewinding to what you were saying about Jacobo, something that surprised me a lot. And I, by the way, I also have the the joy and luxury to to have met um his daughter Stusha, Stusha. and also his first um wife Lisette and and you know I can also drop them voice messages and it, it's just so lovely because I it brings me closer to Jacobo in a way but what I was going to say if you read Jacobo's autobiography and I always messed up the title La Conquista del Templo or La Batalla por el Templo. I always messed it up. Um, one of those. And also his other more, if you want, um, galactic autobiographies like yeah. La Fuerza Vital del Cielo Interior and so on. Well, you realize, especially in the in the earthly biography, autobiography, that he was a he was a very strange kind of scientist in the sense that we like to present him. Yeah, we, we, we're touching on hard stuff here. We like to present him as like the super scientist, white coat. And, and we can talk about those experiments in the lab, you know, with transfer potential and, and so on. Electrophysiology or EEG and so on. But when he tells you what he was doing, he went to New York and then he just came back and then he, he rented this this hut in the middle of nowhere. And then he was there meditating and then... He, he was with with his daughter for some time, and then he met this other person, maybe a girlfriend, and then they were doing this crazy shit, and they were meeting meeting crazy people. And then at some point in this autobiography, he said, "Well, at some point I had to come back to the lab and more or less kind of show myself, show up in in the university in la universidad." And he also expresses it like I had to go and do this kind of boring work. So, <laughs> so he was a scientist, but he was to me more than a scientist he was an explorer of consciousness and and he used science because because it's it's great and, and he was trained on it but i don't know how much time energy and attention he he spent on proper laboratory science as we know it and all the other kind of explorations they were trying to levitate in 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 in, in they would they would inflate some some kind of matrices and they were trying to see if they could levitate and who knows what they ate and what they drink and then and then he spent all those nights with Pachita I mean it's a true explorer plus and there's let me say another thing uh, that surprised me as I was getting into his work yes he has theories but he doesn't know a lot about mathematics for instance but he he's very creative so his superpower I would say it's imagination he and that's why he could write these 40 something books so it defies a little bit the stereotype of a scientist because he spent more time outside of the lab doing crazy shit and more time imagining than rationalizing stuff but he also did that so it's two times remarkable i think carl young talks about this collective consciousness and i think Jacobo was connected to it in a sense that's why his imagination was so massive yeah, yeah. And it's good you make this remark because we tend to think of imagination as making things up. That's not imagination. That's fiction. Imagination is is yeah, it's it's submitting your mind to the creative energy of the universe and 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 try, tap and draw from it. So and and the great scientists and we, I'm tired of listening to people quote Einstein, but they all speak about those more intuitive imaginative creative realms that's where they that's the supermarket that's where they go for their ideas then they need to cook them and present them in a more rational way but it's in dreams or in visions um that they that they get the raw material do you think that greenberg uh greenberg's synergic theory is 
uh, as groundbreaking as I think it is because um, this, well, let, let's first uh, give give us your definition what you understand to be the synthetic theory because I think it's important okay. for for people. To yes. Know. Okay. Jacobo and he says it explicitly like I'm going to say it now. I think he had he was trying to answer one question and one question only, which is what's the origin of experience? Where does experience come from? Which basically is what today, 30 years after he's disappearing, consciousness studies and consciousness science is taking seriously. So in that sense, one more point of being a pioneer, right? So it's like, well, we have all these experiences. Where do they come from? Like a very simple, very powerful question. So, so that's what he wanted to know. And so to that end, he, as I was saying, explored himself inside as much as he could. He explored bravely outside, going to all these, you know, really impossible places like Pachita and so on. But then he wanted to formalize it in a theory. And so he, his synthetic, synthetic, synthetic theory, the word in Spanish works better, synthetic. I don't know how it's said in English, which, by the way, we should talk about the problem of having this, having written all of that mostly in Spanish and being ignored by the Anglo-American dominating world if it wasn't enough for them to be to be dogmatic but also they're Anglo Anglo-centric so so if it's in Spanish it doesn't count and you know we know what that means we'll talk about this but synthetic synthetic theory what's the origin of experience and then he and you can see this sorry because I'm doing all these footnotes but you see this if you read his former books he has these really thick books on space why is he talking about space so much, you know? But it, it's not, again, it's not like here are these third order differential equations with tensors and, and, and mathematical stuff nobody can understand. No, he's saying, look, I look at something at the horizon and I'm moving. Like, let's, I see the moon and I'm moving and then I, I still see the moon. Therefore, what does it mean for space here now as, as the, the rays of light hit my retina? It means that in some sense, the moon is contained here, but I can also move and it's also there. So, so on the, I'm, I'm bringing here the first key element, space. He, he did a lot of phenomenology on space, meaning how do I experience space? What space may mean? He was then drawing from, from hardcore physics, right? And the quantum mechanical stuff. And this can be taken literally or as an analogy. There's something to critique there. But anyways, so he says there is this um, field in space and he, he talks about the lattice, la, la lattice, no? It's like this, esta malla, no? This this greed, fabric. however you want. To, yeah, this fabric, exactly. That's a better word. Thank you in English. Uh, okay, there is this on the one hand. And then we have what he calls el campo neuronal, neuronal field, because brains are special. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. There's something going on with, I'm not sure if in our brains, but with our brains. So he says, we have space and you. we will need to talk a lot about what he means by space. And, and then we have the neuronal field produced in our brains by our brains and then these two fields and by the way a field is a is a f concept also borrowed from physics and if you scratch beneath the surface of all those concepts very soon you get into the unknown like what is a field you know <laughs> what is a field yeah. some some region of influence extended in space and time okay so we have two fields space and neuronal and when they interact that's the kind of the first alchemy theoretical alchemy when those fields interact, there is where that's how, although it's not a mechanism, but that's how experience emerges. And then he needs a few more elements that he was putting in his theory. And you can think of his theory as something like work in progress, because then he later on, and this is also that if you read his work, because he's always repeating his own current formulation of the Teoria Sintergica. And it's super beautiful if you have the time to, to see how He's mending it. He's changing it. He's adding something. Sometimes it feels like the, the interaction between these two fields by itself gives rise to experience. And then she says, well, no, no, no. We need also some central processor. And of course, what do you mean by central processor? And he borrows from informatics and computer science. And then, and then he uses his own jargon and factor de direccionalidad. And then he later on says, well, that's not even enough because there must be some observador, an observer with capital O, and that becomes more, if you wish, 
more higher up. But basically, he was invoking these fields from physics and neuroscience and saying that their interaction would produce our own experiences and then adding on top of them more elements that were perhaps more mystic. Yeah. Uh, they produce reality in a sense. Yes, right? they produce reality. And, and another thing to say about that is, well, how to frame Jacobo's philosophy, right? And certainly it wasn't materialistic. It wasn't what we're told in science today, like everything is ultimately made of matter and consciousness comes later and as an epiphenomenon, like smoke that comes from a, from a steam engine. No, no, no. And and over the years, you can read in his writing the, the more central place he was giving to consciousness and the observer. So he was leaning towards what today we may call idealism, although it's not necessary to put him in a box of philosophical ism, but certainly he wasn't subscribing to the mainstream view that, that by the way, became popular. And this is also, this is incredible in terms of temporal synchronicities, because, you know, he disappeared that in December 1920, sorry, 1994. And then 95, 96 is the year where there's this famous Tucson conference on consciousness and then it's when David Chalmers, the famous philosopher, um, starts to talk about the heart problem. And that's where the, the Nobel laureate um, Francis Crick um, starts to say, well, consciousness is now a scientific field that we can study. So it's like he did all this work before that. And then he disappears. And then Orthodox consciousness studies is reborn or born 30 years ago. So we're celebrating kind of two birthdays or two anniversaries, right? One, it's unfortunate, it's his disappearing. And the other one, it's it's both fortunate and unfortunate. It's it's the, the, the takeover of orthodox science of the study of consciousness, which is a good thing because we can talk about it, but it's a bad thing because it has started and continues to be dominated by this materialistic view of the world. That, of course, leaves no room whatsoever to extraocular vision, um, these healings that Pachita did, the telepathy, or if you wish, the, the neurophysiological basis of, of the transferred potential and, and so on. So, this, I agree with that, though. Uh, but in a sense, I think uh, Dr. Greenberg managed to... That's part of his legacy, right? Because the uh, Imaginarium grew exponentially after he disappeared and all of that was already in the ether and many of the people who you're talking about that started this consciousness studies took a little bit from what he did but they, there's there was still that stigma to much of his work and you mentioned Pachita I think it's very important to, to understand hello the reason he you froze wanted... you froze for for uh, about 10 seconds and maybe okay. it was me uh, yeah yeah uh can you hear me now yes okay you you were talking about mentioned pachita mm -hmm. i think it's very important for us to uh understand why he chose to go to pachita who pachita is and what her work was and if it, if if it's believable in a sense, because uh, yeah. what she did, uh, what Dr. Greenberg uh, talks about in the, in the book about her, is today impossible, according to today's materialistic world that you talk about. Yeah, yeah, it's the ultimate impossibility, even according to some colleagues of mine who are post-materialist or even anti-materialist and embrace um, consciousness as, as universal and fundamental and all of that, they would say, what the, f <laughs> you know, like when you tell them about that, because it's not only, as we were discussing before, the ability to perceive information in an anomalous way, when we were discussing extraocular vision and these perceptual abilities of some people, it has to do with matter itself. And, and that's, that's harder. I mean, I must admit, one can try to rationalize how this information 
transfer may happen beyond ordinary means. Okay, information, maybe. But here we're talking about a woman who every night, and, and by the way, she was working with eyes closed. And I think Jacobo mentions that he she may be using also extraocular vision. But I suppose at her level, who knows what that was. But what he were talking about, this is the, the, the obscene thing, right, to the intellect. But a woman who would take a, 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 a shitty knife and with her own hands and that shitty knife every night or every other night just open people's bodies to heal them of whatever they came with her eyes closed. And if that wasn't enough <laughs> to piss you off, he would pull out physical organs, sometimes even bones, sometimes even backbones, and he would materialize, <laughs> you know, um, healthy organs and just put them back in. You know, how, how, how much crazy, preposterous, impossible, outrageous this can get if, if just materialize say it. them out of thin air. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was doing impossible. that every night. Now, of course, again, both spectrums. Oh, psychic healing. We know. And then there are famous videos of who was that? Like the magical Randy, you know, these famous skeptics. Because by the way, I work with, with magicians and illusionists. It's good. Because for them, all of that can only be a trick. right? So there are these videos how all these so-called psychic healers or physical healers are just fraud and they say look i can fake it and they surely can fake it now does this mean that pachita was faking it right um there are countless i mean if you ask about the data of course the, she wasn't doing it in a laboratory under a microscope but there are countless and countless of cases and jacobo wrote men you know was kind of the 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 uh, anthropologist here writing this down um so what are we to make of those it's not anecdotal you know the word anecdote means etymologically means not worth publishing because it's like one or two weird things but when as somebody said and i forgot the plural of anecdote is data so if you've had this for many 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 nights it's not anecdotal evidence and nope. so well what was going on i have no idea i have no idea i by the way i've I've met rigorous scientists who are well known and who've been invited to other places. One told me in particular, one one healer in Brazil, I forgot his name, and they've been to these um, kind of events and they've seen it, and it's the same impression. And and Jacobo himself came back every night and say, I don't know, I mean. It's impossible. Like, how is this even happening? Like, one more thing to add, and sorry if I'm talking too much. I've talked with also, because I, I meet a lot of people from different backgrounds, and I ask them those things too. And I've spoken with somebody who spent a lot of time studying some tribes in, in Indonesia or somewhere like this. And, well, there's something about what we understand as reality. And, and the for instance, the light conditions, it's... It, the whole thing is like a bending of reality, like it's dark and there's perhaps some sort of suggestion and kind of mental work of preparation and ceremony. So this is not like you put a dead corpse on the table with lights and camera recording and you do the operation. It goes together with the context. And maybe that's one of the big difficulties in wanting to study this scientifically, that if you remove it from its context, it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean it's a trickster effect. Does it mean it's just a super well-crafted magic trick? Well, I don't think so, but it's really hard to tell scientifically. To all those people who were healed, if only, I mean, some of them may still be alive. I mean, again, and with names and surnames and people who would travel from France and, and the wife and the husband. And, and well, they could say if they got in there, whatever it happened, whatever happened there, if they got in there, with a broken rib or a brain tumor, and they then they get they got out of it, and a few days later, the thing was healed or solved. Well, 
what what are we make what are we to make of those <laughs> i think belief Impossible. plays a, plays a big part in that doesn't it belief well, from the patient i think yes 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 because you know you <laughs> have you imagine can, can you imagine i've tried like would i for instance let me ask you this or you can ask me but would you go to pachita imagine you have for instance i told you i had this medical thing right and and they did surgery on me from here to here would i have the balls to go to pachita depends <laughs> on your belief <laughs> even if she's the super healer like Come on, there's something quite strong about the mind of not just the the, the so-called healer, but but the people involved in it, and also the helpers, right? The Kobo and the guys who were she would say, now put the hand here, now apply this pressure here. Now, well, it's a uh, well, what a scene, what a scene, and I'm not sure if I would dare. You need to believe, have, and that that yeah, I have an experience. Uh which happened to me when I was like 13 or 14 years old. Um, Amara Kame, which is like a Mexican shaman from the north of Mexico, uh, he came to my house and he took my mother to uh, go on a peyote trip uh, to the desert. And when they came back, um, this Marakame wanted to do perform uh, like a healing process on me. He immediately saw me and he told me uh, to stand uh, right in front of him. And he started chanting uh, some, I don't know, from his tribe. And when he started doing that, he told me to close my eyes. And I shit you not, I felt something just appeared inside my mouth. Like... And I was like, what the hell is this? I thought uh, I broke a tooth. And he he was like, he, he extended his hand to my mouth. And he was like, escupe, like spit it out. Yeah, yeah. It was like a red little rock that he told me that he took it out of me because uh, it was bothering me in some way. And I still can't explain how that happened to me. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i felt it I, I was like i thought i i broke a tooth but no it, it was like a red stone it was weird yes yes i actually when i when i met first time i met in person ida Cuellar, the, the director of the documentary it was it was it was really fun because we've been exchanging phone calls and and messages and then i'm sitting on a plane flying to italy and then i see this man coming in it's like he looks like Ida Cuellar. And then he sits in the seat to the other side back to me. And I was turning around. I, I didn't know if I would dare. And then I text him, did you just came in a plane? He's like, oh, yes. Are you there? And then we turn around and we were there and we met for the first time in person. So we asked the, the other person <laughs> next to him to, to swap places. And then we sat down. And for, I don't know how long the flight was from Barcelona to Florence, an hour and a half. We were talking all about all of that like crazy. I thought, oh my god, like the whole plane maybe maybe just calling security. Like, what are these guys talking about? And and he was <laughs> explaining from his own point of view. I mean, he's a very special man, and also from his interactions and reading of Khodorovsky and also Patrick Harpur. Well, how how to start thinking about these realities? And well, it wasn't that I came out with a clear scientific protocol to study them, but for a moment, things made sense. I mean, it's possible. It's possible to understand that this could be happening. Now, if we go back to Jacobo, why is Jacobo using Pachita's data as inspiration for the theory or confirmation of the theory or refutation? Well, his own synthetic synthetic theory allows, not only allows, it welcomes and it, it works well with the idea because we were talking about space and how there are distortions of space and and what's going on with the brain and these lattice as, as some fabric that's imagined that's that's relaxed and pure but then if you start contorting it that may give rise to matter for instance right so from that point of view the materialization of objects which is a complete taboo 
But at the same time, in physics, if you have energy, you can turn it into matter. Well, it may have to do with the capacity to bend and unbend space. And if, if the, the neural field is in interaction with that, well, our own brains or our own minds, according to the theory, may be able to play with that. And actually, that's what he says Pachita is doing. And I don't know how she learned about it, but that's what she was doing. So from his point of view, from his theory, it felt... in 1983, 81, 82, in, in, a, in a journal called Bioenergetics or something like this, that it's really hard to get. And I was actually was declassified from the CIA program, Information Wait, Act. Sorry. Yes. And I rushed to, to find those papers. And they're really strange. They put, he put some, some, some balances in a shielded room. And she, no, again, it's not only information perception is... The ability to to change matter itself, which would, would bring us to um, other current spooky themes like UFOs and UAPs, and even ultimate theories of everything in physics and gravitation and how to change gravitation. I mean, big, big, big unknowns. <laughs> but he dared again to go to visit Pachita for many nights and also to even run some experiments. Of course, I'm. I, I also must say those experiments haven't been replicated and there's not a lot of detail. So and this is important, you know, just because Jacobo published one paper saying that it doesn't mean scientifically proven, right? I mean, come on, yeah. science doesn't work like that. But it all fit into his theory, worldview, experiences. It was all held together. These experiments you talk about, they're the ones he performed with Dr. Amit Goswami, right? No, these are others. This, this, as I, as far as I know, the no, and I, and I know, so I don't need to be. <laughs> so, so the, the ones he did with Goswami had to do with the transferred potential. It's, okay. it's, it's taking the the idea of physical entanglement. We can talk about it and see if brains could also be entangled as physical particles. Did are they entangled. prove that? Well, they yes, well, they did these experiments where they were recording from some subjects and then they put them in pairs, they put them together exactly as you would do. So basically he took the anal he he took what what's literally done in, in physical systems in laboratories. You take fu take fundamental particles, maybe you take an electron or and then you you put them together so that they interact and then they you separate them. You isolate them, and then you perform something. Some you you manipulate or you stimulate, however you want to call it. You do something on one, and then you see if the other has noticed. And the really crazy thing about entanglement is that if you do something on one, because of how how quantum mechanics works, and you know the description you have as to the states of those systems until you don't measure them, you cannot go from virtual to actual, and therefore. If there were interaction before and you haven't screwed it up, if you touch something and the other one knows. Now, how does it know? And that's what puzzled and, and angered Einstein. And that's why he said that's spooky action at a distance. Because basically, and, and this is <laughs> this is a rabbit hole, because why is this problematic? Because then quantum mechanics would be saying things that according to relativity theory, which is the other major theory in physics, are impossible again. Because in relativity theory, you cannot allow signals to travel faster than the speed of light. But in this experiment, when you do something on this, this other one knows, but there doesn't seem to be some email or WhatsApp or message or particle sent to tell it that this has happened to this other person. Sorry, this other particle. Now, Jacobo took that and said, well, can we do this with brains? So instead of particles, you have people, put them together, then you put them apart, and you're recording from both of them their neural activity and the means they had then, which are, you know, compared to what we have today, it's like prehistory. So even with those means, right, you could record the, the neural activity, at least of some gross areas of the brain. And then here the the what was activation was that you would show, you would flash some light, or you, you know, visually Simulation. stimulate. Yes, yeah. you usually stimulate, and then you see, of course, that there's some pulses in the brain because of that stimulation, and then you would try to 
correlate that with whatever may be happening in the partner's brain and then do this over different pairs, do some statistics. I mean, science is always like that. You need to do statistics, repeat, do analysis and show, you know, on the one hand, you have the, 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 the activation of potential means like the neural activity changing and here you have the, activa the activated one. And then he spoke about the transferred one, potential transferido. And so he found it and other people tried to replicate after him and some didn't and some did. So it's still, okay. you know, we need to work more on it. And with, because you were asking about Goswami and I actually zoomed with Goswami maybe one month or two months ago, I got his contact and I could ask him. So they, how was it? I don't know how they met if, if, if Jacobo asked him or, or Goswami asked him, but they, they actually, Goswami went to Mexico and they met. And Gos, Goswami had been more on the theory side, proponent of you know consciousness and its relation with quantum stuff, which is still to be seen, but he was, Goswami was really a pioneer then. And so they wrote this paper in, in 1994, published the very same year that Jacobo disappeared, um, where on the one hand, Goswami was presenting his his theoretical um, vision of, of consciousness and quantum mechanics, and Jacobo was bringing in his synthetic theory, which matched plus those experiments. So this is the famous EPR, because the EPR is Einstein, Polosky, Rosen, um, phenomenon critique of that being impossible in in in, in physical particles. So it, that's called the EPR paper of Jacobo, because that's where he did the entanglement. Now it was last year, well now the previous year, two years ago, one year and a half ago, the Nobel Prize in Physics was given to Aspect and others who finally proved empirically that entanglement is real, that there are no there are no some, as they call, loopholes that could explain why, in that case, the ele one electron knew about its partner. So, in a way, entanglement has been certified with a Nobel Prize, meaning that clear. non, yeah, the clear. non locality, non we're locality talking, we're is real. About, we're talking about quantum entanglement, right? Yes, quantum entanglement. Yes, yes. Okay. So this has been certified eighty years later by the top mainstream community with a Nobel Prize, non-locality is freaking real in the physical world. The question is, it is, all, is it also freaking real in the mental world, knowing that mind and matter are probably two sides of the same coin? So yes. So And this is perhaps the most well-known experiment and result of Jacobo, right? Like the, they call it, they, they prove telepathy, but it wasn't telepathy because for it to be telepathy, one person should think of something and the other should have the awareness and say, okay, I think you're thinking about that. But in that case, it was just the neurophysiological basis for that non-local information transfer that, again, should be impossible according to what we're told about brains and minds. So this is where I, I connected Dr. Greenberg's work and the phenomenon because uh, I got interested and it clicked to me uh, when I saw the whole case of Dr. Greenberg, because I had experiences uh, with telepathy uh, when I was, it was 2006, I think. But uh, I took like, um, like a short road to it, like uh, an atajo, uh, because I used psychedelics and I had an experience with two other people who I, I I actually talked to them about it recently because I wasn't sure if it really happened or not. Because, you know, it's telepathy. I mean, we heard each other's thoughts, which should be impossible. And when I talked to them recently, they were like, yeah, we did it. it it's real. And what I wanted to know, and I want to know still, is I think Dr. Greenberg's work is a guide to do that or get to that point without the need of psychedelics because I, I i don't i don't think psychedelics are necessarily bad uh, in a sense but i do think they're not for everyone and i also think that if we manage to do these things that i was able to do with psychedelics without them 
I think it will be uh, like a one of the biggest discoveries of our lifetimes, mm. to be honest with you. Yeah. Pavel, um, this conversation with you is being, maybe it doesn't look like, but one of the most difficult I've had because you, you, you ask such key, like these red herrings. These are big, big red herrings questions because we could talk about how great everything is, but you asked me about the kids and seeing weird stuff and you asked me about now. So this is another, and I'll be again honest with you, I don't know. On the one hand, I've listened to countless hours of Terence McKenna online saying we have the right to experience with our own minds and all of that, right? At the same time, there's something, and it's just gut feeling, there's something about psychedelics that I share, a feeling about them that I share with you as, as, as I think your question betrays, right? It's like, are we always going to use kind of the, 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 the fast shortcut to hyperspace kind of, yes, it's, it's endogenously happening here, but it's because I took something, right? It's like, if you could do the analogy of um, um, sports, Olympic games with doping, you see, maybe it's a bad analogy, but it's like, do I really want to be able to run a marathon just because I'm doping myself? And of course, what is doping or what isn't, you know, I need to drink and eat to be able to do a marathon, right? But let me just put it in a more grandiose way. If if those things we're talking about are not just funky, cool curiosities of the mind, you see, wow, I can see elves and I can have telepathy, like, you know, like you can either watch Netflix or just play with these things. If it's something more serious, more that has to do with humanity writ large, with the evolution of our consciousness and so on, then I think there's room to seriously ask, well, maybe maybe we can open those doors with psychedelics and realize there are things there. I've also done psychedelics. Is it something to recommend to everyone? Maybe not. And But once you've seen what's in there, then you may ask, well, how do I open those doors without such help? This means meditación autoalusiva, for instance. Or this means um, all the many more normal, um, even you could call it, these are spiritual practices, right? So, and and again, there's a third, so that I always do a polarity and then a third option, like between saying, oh, psychedelics, bad, bad, bad. It was tragic that they were um, banned from even investigation, not, not even That's consumption no for decades. Eh? Yeah, they were banned. But then to, to now say, well, now that they're going to be sanctioned again, oh, let's just have psychedelic retreats all day long. Come on. I mean, maybe there's a third way, which is we know now, we now know and you know what what shamans and other people knew, and we are Westerners that we do this in in our own house and we can just access those aspects of reality. Now, how can I get there by my own feet? So I'm with you there. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I do think that they do work for people in order to open their, those doors of perception that Dr. Hoffman's talked about. But I do also think that people, there are many who never needed them. Uh, for example, uh, the Kundalini yoga, people who do that constantly, they open those doors of perception uh, just through yoga. And I know that for a fact because I know people who have the same or similar experiences when you're uh, on psychedelics without psychedelics. And you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I also think that um, in a sense, uh, it, it wasn't a coincidence that they were banned in the 60s. I think that the governments, and this is a personal opinion, I think that the world governments realized that these were tools for people to get out of their system, their, their superimposed systems of control. And when they saw the potential uh, that they had, that's why they banned them, I, I think. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, totally. Um... Yeah, there's a lot written about how the political story about, well, what are we going to do with those? We we need to stigmatize, not only ban them, but also stigmatize them. And it's it's so unfortunate, you know, unfortunate that this happened. Now, then we need to think why 
is this being allowed today? Uh, of course, for in economic interests, which is one of the lowest and more obvious drivers of all of that. But I think, yeah, there are more derivatives to be made as to thinking whether that's the route we want to explore. And there are many routes, and maybe there, there are different routes for, for different people. I've had, you were mentioning this, uh, I've, I've had, I, I, haven't, I haven't had psychedelics many times, but the few times I've had them, I've had remarkable experiences that stay with me for life. In a way, in the same category, you would send landscape or archipelago, if we speak about islands, as, as my near-death experience, there's something about those that is really valuable in my life. Um, but I haven't done them for what ten years now, or or you know. So, and by the way, I don't think you get addicted to them, but you can get addicted in another way because it's so spectacular what they open that you know you just know you need to do that. And for a more long-lasting and evolutionary stable change, well, the great yogis. Let me mention, for instance, the great yogis in India. And, and by the way, I've come across this when, when reading all this literature about extraocular vision and all these psychic powers and so on. The great gurus, the, the real deal, the guys that really were doing the hard job, you know, the avatars, that's a way to call them, the avatars. They describe all these psychic phenomena and all of that like just, just side effects of their important work. And for instance, in, well... In some places, they open ashrams and people starting doing crazy things like levitating objects and stuff like that. This has been reported. You can think it's bullshit, right? And then the guru said, well, no, we, we're not here to play video games like that. We're here to do yoga, proper yoga. So enough, enough of the dancing tables and enough of telepathy. It's like kids. Another way to explain this is, well, you're not ready for it, dear humans. You're not ready. You're still kids or teenagers, and you may have a sense of what it is like to be an adult, but we cannot give those, you know, the keys to the car and and to the fire to cook and all of that because it needs a lot of mastery, which fits back into one of those difficult questions you made me a few minutes ago about when you open these doors, <laughs> you know how to open them. Do you know how to close them, by the way? Yeah. You know? Do you have do you have blinders? Do you know what the key is? And because you can unleash things that then you don't want. I have a friend who, well, they're not a friend, but somebody who wrote to me asking for help because she awakened her Kundalini and she's miserable. She cannot move. And it's been like this for years, right? So one must speak about the, the lights and the shadows of all of that. Yeah, it is a Pandora's box in a sense. Yeah. And I, I wanted to um, let you know though, because I, I do want to have, many more conversations but i think we're almost an hour and a half deep I think are we it will be, i think it will be a good idea to maybe pause this and uh, get another conversation if if it's possible next week yes yeah, i'm continue. enjoying it tremendously let's do it thank you thank you me too I, I actually think you talked about synchronicities a lot and i think that word will keep coming up uh, mm. Because um, people who are like minded in this area, they they find each other. I think it's it's not a coincidence. All right. What do you think? Yes. Well, coincidence and um, coincidences. Well, this this meaningful coincidence. I mean, there is a there there, there there's one of those high level theories or philosophies about reality. It's called dual aspect monism. And, and recently it's been proposed that meaning is kind of the glue. They put it in these ways. It's the glue between what we call mind and what we call matter. And so let's not take meaning for granted when things happen. And, and the more they happen, the more that you let them happen, the more, the more synchronicities take place and it's 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 overwhelming sometimes like wow and again some of them may be seeing faces in the clouds but others are i mean pretty pretty sure they something is being connected that one would think it's impossible and yet it has happened <laughs> yeah i agree um on the next time we meet i hope we do get to talk 
more about the phenomenon where, where I think they connect even more and about these experiencers who I think are very similar to Pachita and the shamans in many ways, but in a sense, they are accidental uh, experiencers. Mm. And, and there is a, a I, I, I sent you something about Dr. Gary Nolan. I know, I don't know if you have looked into it a little bit more, but I think uh, we're going to leave that for the next conversation we have, because it is a really long and interesting subject that we I think it would be interesting for you to explore and I want to hear your thoughts about it uh, when we talk with yeah, next yeah I'm willing to I'm learning with you from you as well so I'm, I'm willing to just step onto whatever terrain you wish um although I didn't know about Nolan and, and anything like that but it resonates with the book I'm reading from Carlos Eide who was born in Havana, but now lives in the States, uh, a scholar of, of religions, who's written a book called They Flew, Ellos Volaron. Yeah. And it's about the levitations and bilocations of saints. And when you learn, I mean, and most of those saints, by the way, were Spanish, um, nuns and, and priests and so on, and Italian as well. And when you learn about their lives and what happened to them and how little in control they were of what whatever the you know the heck was was happening to them and and the testimonies of people and also also the the physical aspects of what would happen with their clothing and with space time i mean it's just fascinating it's like you're reading this historical account which sounds like sci-fi and the same time, to me, it speaks about Jacobo Greenberg, it speaks about fundamental physics, it speaks about UAP, it speaks about how science is done, and, and even the expression, Abogado del Diablo, Devil's Advocate, came from the trials that were made in order to, to tell, first, if those were miracles or not, the impossible, and second, what, what was the cause? What was, was God-like or de devil-like? So, well, I'm not sure if, I, I suspect it's related to Nolan, yeah. although I haven't that went gone into it it is it is i think it is and we're we're gonna talk more deeply into it uh when we talk uh, again uh but for now i'm gonna have to uh pause this for a little bit because i think we're both very busy i do have a very busy day and but man it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for uh, taking the time to do it uh where can people find you and what do you have going on how can people uh, look for yeah, you online? I have lots of things going on. <laughs> and maybe we can spend some time unfolding them on another occasion. I'm I'm easy and I'm not easy to find because I don't have, I mean, I don't have my YouTube channel or I don't have, you know, my own foundation or things like that. But if they type, let's just let, let uh, the algorithms of Google <laughs> um, let people know so they just they, they can type my name, Alex Gomez Marin. Then they can get scientific papers, they may get some interviews online, they may get my videos in Spanish about Greenberg. And um, I also lead a center in Italy called the Paris Center. We do lots of events there online and in person. So I'm I'm a bit scattered, whatever the algorithm <laughs> retrieves me. And they can write to me. Uh, they can, I won't give my email, but if they find it, it's, it's findable. They can write to me and I appreciate it. Um, of course, one gets some, I must say, crazy shit that one doesn't know what to do with it. It's like, well, this could be true, but I don't have time to examine it. I'm sorry, but, but at the same time, sometimes I get, well, you, the same with you it just wrote me out of the blue. I, I, I felt it was worthwhile talking to you and I think I guessed correctly. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so All I'm right. going to leave, I'm going to leave your Twitter account. Is that, if right. that's okay in the description? Yeah. yeah. So people, if they are interested in anything, they can uh, communicate with you through there. Also, I'm going to leave a link to the Jacobo Greenberg Academy YouTube channel. All right. Yeah. You, okay. You have many videos there. Is that yeah, your record, channel? No, I record videos and I send them to them because, well, Lea, Lea, who was one of the students of Jacobo, has kind of taking, retaken the interest of promoting that. And so 
they asked me if I could do something with them, and so I'm recording videos and sending them to, to them. Um, but so yes, and uh, maybe later I can send you a few more links. I mean, I have a website where I have all my my written work in science and all my talks, and so you can also post that there. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Behavior of Organisms dot org. Okay. I'm That's the old, the, this is kind of the, the old name of, of my lab, but in it, I have everything. And the Twitter um, handle, I don't know which one you're going to use, but I have one that I'm not using, which is Agomez Marin. And the one I'm using is Behavior Organisms. That's the one uh, I'm going to... Yeah, answer, so you can put that on my website that I'll send you, and that should be enough. That should be enough, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, Gracias. Dr. Alex Gomez Marin, thank you for this. <laughs> uh, we'll talk soon again. But for now, I'm going to have to leave you. Uh, and remember, people, stay curious. Take care. Yeah. Que tengas buen día. Un abrazo. Igualmente, amigo.